Ja. Hi, Derek. I had my uh, speaker on mute there for a second if somebody said anything. Hey, everyone. Looks like a lot of people joining. I'm gonna give everyone just a few minutes to get logged in here. Hmm. Sounds like we might have some troubleshooting to do on the webinar invitation. Sorry about that, folks. Yeah, we'll get that fixed for next time. I'll give everybody just an extra minute because of that. Um, in case they had to re-register. Start here in just a few moments. Thank you for the feedback on that. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to our fourth Tuesday of every month webinar. Today's topic is Are Monte Carlo Simulations Good Predictors of Retirement Outcomes with Justin Fitzpatrick and Derek Tharp. And this will be, uh, we will be having a, an educational webinar uh, the fourth Tuesday of every month. And also for our users, we do have a third Tuesday of every month. Um, Lab Talk Tuesdays webinar, so feel free to join both of those. Uh, at the at, Throughout this webinar, we will have a place on the side where you can uh, add questions, and you can also upvote each other's questions if you would like them to be addressed at the end. We will have some time for questions at the end. Also, at the end of this webinar, a survey will be coming around via Zoom. Please take a moment to fill that out as well, because feedback is very important to us, and we can uh, always look for new topics or address questions. And last but not least, if you have plan-specific questions, please always visit us at our help center within the app or email us at info at incomelaboratory.com. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Justin, and we'll get rocking and rolling. All right. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, everybody, for, for joining us. So, um, this presentation is um, is going over some work that that Derek and I have been doing, um, and and it's really a, around, you know, trying to figure out how to do retirement planning in the way that is is best for clients. And part of that is really kind of basic research that you know surprisingly maybe it ha hasn't been done or or you know there's not a lot in this area. Um, so when when people use uh, tools that make forecasts in order to as as part of their retirement planning and and for some retirement plans this is super important um, they're assuming that the the forecasts they get the numbers like probability of success um, 
are reasonably accurate, right? I mean, I don't think anybody is expecting that, um, you know, it's it's precise down to the decimal point or anything like that. But you certainly would expect, for example, that if you got in a um, in in a, a planning tool something like an eighty percent probability of success, um, that in fact, uh, you know, when as often as that planning tool gives an eighty percent probability of success, that in fact those those plans tend to succeed about 80% of the time, right? I mean, that, that's just kind of an assumption. Um, we can kind of miss that assumption sometimes because, uh, you know, the tools can can be, you know, quite good, presented in a certain way, and we just kind of um, trust, right, that, that, that things are done well. But it's important to remember that anytime we're using analysis to do planning for, for clients, um, we're, we're using a model of the world, not the world itself, right? So we're always one step at least re removed from that. Um, and so, you know, the, because these kinds of estimates can be super important for the, the, the kinds of advice that, that you give to clients, um, it's worth asking, you know, are, are the are these accurate uh, forecasts actually accurate? And, and, you know, are there any things that we can learn about these forecasts that could help us um, do better planning for, for clients? Because, you know, we're giving really consequential financial advice to people often based on these kinds of numbers. Now, in, in income lab software, you'll never see a probability of success gauge. You'll never see the words probability of success or probability of failure because, um, you know, every, everything done in Income Lab is is adjustment focused. So it's the idea that you're, you're a guide through retirement and then by guiding them through retirement, um, they wouldn't fail or run out of money. They would simply adjust their behavior. Um, but even in Income Lab, you know, kind of under the hood, estimates of risk and forecasts and things are important. So this is um, this is just as important for Income Lab as, as for, you know, kind of uh, generalized uh, software that that does use success and failure framing. Um, so what we assume when we when we get something like a 80% probability of success is that we're somewhere around this middle blue box, right? Now, it does, again, the actual success rate, I think we'd all be plenty happy if it was 75 to 85 or something like that, right? But um, we, we want it to be roughly in line. What we don't want is that I see an 80% probability of success forecast, but in fact, those kinds of plans tend to succeed only 40% of the time, right? So that would be um, a model, a forecasting model that is vastly underestimating risk. Um, I actually also don't want a forecasting model that says, you know, I have a 40% chance of success when in fact um, those kinds of plans end up succeeding 70% of the time. That would be overestimating risk. Um, this is probably a little now, now this example is extreme, so I certainly wouldn't want this. This is this is way out of whack. Um, but if I had to choose between, you know, slightly overestimating or slightly underestimating, I would probably choose overestimating in kind of the following the philosophy of, you know, kind of under promise over deliver. Um, because you know the, the news to a client that whoops, actually things are better than I thought they were um is is uh is is good news. Whereas actually things are worse than I thought they were is is bad news. So um, Derek and I have done some work on on trying to figure out you know looking at different approaches to modeling the world, different approaches to Monte Carlo simulation, historical simulation, and so on. You know how how do these things play out in in the real world? And I think the best way to understand how you can study that question. Is to look at a different one that we that that seems pretty familiar and, and pretty straightforward, which is um, forecasting rain. So, uh, you know, meteorologists use all sorts of different weather models, right? Which could be you know analogous to different kinds of simulation models, different kinds of Monte Carlo analysis, historical analysis, and so on. So, I think the the analogy goes pretty far, actually. And also in predicting rain we're not typically given categorical forecasts, right? Yes, no. Will will it rain tomorrow? Yes or no? Instead, we get probabilistic forecasts, which is the same thing that, that you may be familiar with in retirement planning or, or financial planning more generally. So let's say, for example, that, that these are two possible forecasts. You know, will it rain tomorrow? Yes. Or, well, there's a 75% chance it'll rain tomorrow. 
Now, if it doesn't rain tomorrow, clearly the probabilistic forecast was more accurate, right? Because it didn't, it, 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 it sort of allowed for the possibility that, that it wouldn't rain. Um, let's say it does rain tomorrow, and these were the forecasts. It says, you know, one is no, it definitely won't, and the other one says, well, there's a 25% chance. Clearly, again, the probabilistic forecast is is um, more accurate in this case because it does allow for the chances that 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 it will rain. It just says that the likelihood is low. Um, and so, when we want to um, kind of give a grade to different forecasting models, we want to look at how far off they are from the actual outcomes. Um, and one way to think about that is. Um, just looking at the error. Um, so, for example, if if I say yes, it will definitely rain, but it doesn't rain, my error is we could say 100%. Right? I'm completely off. Uh, if I say it will not rain, zero percent chance, but it does rain, again, I'm I'm 100% off. So my error is you know 100%. Um, for probabilistic forecasts are generally not zero or 100%. So for for anything in between, it's it's that that's still what we're looking at. We're saying, well, how far off from the actual outcome was it? It either rained or it didn't. Um, and so there's always some error. So for example, in, in this case, I'm comparing a good rain model and a bad rain model. Um, and they basically are, are always exactly the opposite of each other. So the good model in the first case is predicting 90% chance of rain, the bad model 10%. It does rain. Um, and clearly the good model is closer. Right, it's 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 not as far off as the bad model, and there's actually a way to 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 sum up and average these these scores. Um, so for the for the math nerds among us, um, this is just the 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 mean squared error. So it's always positive, um, and I want my error to be low. Um, so uh, this is actually called the Breyer score for those uh, who who love stats. Um, but you can just think of it as the the higher the number, um, the worse it is. And there there's lots of Interesting things to talk about um, around these errors and the kinds of errors that we we have and so on. But the thing to remember here is we can score a forecasting model, in this case, a, a rain forecasting model, um, by the error. And all we would need is lots and lots of examples of the forecasts that were made ahead of time and then the actual outcome for the thing it was forecasting. Um, and then we can we can come up with these errors. You can also look at um, forecasts a, a little more granularly to see if there are any trends or patterns, places where the rain forecasting model in this case, you know, does particularly well or particularly poorly, or does it have a particular bias in one direction or another? And the way we do that is we would just group together all of the times that the, the forecasting model, let's say, um, predicted an 80% chance of rain and then see how often it actually rained during that time. Do the same for 70 and 60 and 50 and really every everything there, right? So now, obviously in this case, we would probably want, you know, several years worth of data. We'd probably want um, forecasts in lots of different places, right? So maybe we'd, we would have, um, you know, some in Tucson, Arizona and some in uh, Tampa, Florida and, right? So we would have kind of a, a lot of different environments for this model to, to test. And I think that's somewhat equivalent to, you know, different kinds of retirement income plans, right? Some that are really trying to stretch and, 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 and produce a lot of income for a family given the resources, some that are a lot more conservative and really are, it's a more frugal family given their resources and, and so on. But once we do that, we can see, um, different kinds of biases. So in this case, these are just, you know, made up examples. Let's imagine that there is a, a, a green model and a red model. Um, and you can see the green model is generally predicting um, more rain. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Did I get this? I might have put this one wrong. Um, no, this is, this is, I think, done correct. Sorry, the green model actually has a dry bias here. So this is predicting um, uh, more, less rain than they actually get. And the other one is predicting um, more rain than we actually get. Now, the perfect calibration of a model would be that 
you know, right along the uh, the 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 diagonal, right? Every time I predict an eighty, if I if I look at my bucket of eighty percent predictions, eighty percent of in any in eighty percent of those times it actually rained, right? And again, you're not likely to see um, kind of perfect calibration in a model of something complex. So um, even in rain, I would find that that um, you know pretty pretty hard to to find. Um, you know, you can you can look at like if you're uh, into stats, you may have looked at like the 538 blog and you know look at their predictions on um, major league baseball games, for example. Um, you you won't see great calibration. There are other things that that can be very well calibrated though. Um, for retirement income plans, um, this is uh, this is one of those places where because the world is so complex. I, I really going into this did not expect to see um, particularly good calibrations or particularly low errors. These are the kinds of things that, you know, modeling of them is the model of the world is likely not to capture everything about the world and, and do a really good job. Um, however, um, we, we do expect there to be differences across models. So, so Derek and I looked at four different ways to, um, to produce uh, probabilistic forecasts, right? So this would be, you know, three different kinds of Monte Carlo and historical analysis. And again, we're really focusing on, even though this isn't how Income Lab does things or presents things to clients, we're just taking a very simple question here, which is predict probability of success and then see whether a plan succeeded or failed. So we looked at traditional Monte Carlo, um, reduced Capital market assumption Monte Carlo. So this is just uh, well, I'll, sh I'll show you in a second what each of these are: uh, regime-based Monte Carlo and historical analysis. Um, and in order to test um, the actual outcomes of particular forecasts, what we had to do is set up a a, a, a very just systematic, formulaic way to produce capital market assumptions. Um, and so the way we did that is for traditional Monte Carlo, which uh, most people have used, um, we produced one set of capital market assumptions um, using the averages from the preceding 30 years. So if I was making a prediction um, in, I don't know, January of 1980, I would use the 30 years preceding that to create my capital market assumptions. For reduced capital market assumption, uh, Monte Carlo, we just reduced the, the ones from traditional by 2%, right? So this was meant to sort of reflect um, what some uh, advisors and firms do, which is say, hey, you know, I, I think using historical averages, although, you know, clearly that, that's, there, there is some motivation behind that. I think it let's be a little more conservative and, and bump down our, our capital market assumptions. For regime-based Monte Carlo, we also used historical averages. So again, if I'm in January of, of 1980, I'm only looking to the past. Um, but here we allowed um, the, the forecaster to use all of history, but they, um, they first filtered history only to use the, the times in the past that were closest to that point. Um, and the filter we used was, was CAPE, so um, cyclically adjusted PE ratio. And we just got rid of half of history, the half of history that was that had the 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 cape that was farthest away from where we were in January of 1980, for example. Um, and that's how we created the uh, the regime-based Monte Carlo. For historical, again, January of 1980, we just allowed that um, to use the return and inflation sequences that were available up to that point in time, right? So there's never any you know foresight allowed. This is all kind of we're, we're trying to make sure that at each point in history, we're acting just like we do today, um, where we can't see the future. And just a reminder for um, maybe those who haven't seen it, um, regime-based Monte Carlo has two sets of capital market assumptions. There's one for the near term and one for the long term. Um, you can set, you know, for example, in Income Lab, you can set what you mean by near term. Um, we just used a 10-year period. So near term was 10 years, long term was the rest of the plan. 
Okay, so again, just to go over how this worked, um, it, what we did is for each forecasting point, um, we uh, we created capital market assumptions and we made forecasts um, for the the period to come. Um, and what we did is we we took two hundred different uh, retirement income plans again that were kind of between uh, quite conservative and quite aggressive. So it's sort of you know Tucson versus Tampa. Um, so a, a broad range of those, and we had the model make predictions. Um, we had each model make predictions about the probability of success of that plan, right? So some were going to be, we're going to have very high probability of success. One, we're going to have very low pro probability of success and lots in between. And then as we step through time, this is, you know, we just, um, the, the, each model gets access to more, to more of history. For regime-based Monte Carlo, the same, except that, you know, we just extend the, the, the amount of history available. And same for historical, right? So, and we're doing that across, you know, as much of history as, as we possibly could, which for us um, had us making um, predictions from 1951 to, to 2002. Um, and again, it was just systematic withdrawal plans from a, from a 60-40 stock bond portfolio. This this kind of study could could very easily be done for other types of plans, you know, more more realistic, um, complex plans as well. But this was kind of a a proof of concept and and one that hopefully we can um, extend in the future. Okay, so how did these models perform? Right, we we have you know thousands of forecasts right for each model. Um, what was the, the error level? Well, it turned out that regime-based Monte Carlo and historical analysis had very similar error levels, um, and both of them were about 25% lower than traditional Monte Carlo and the uh, reduced capital market assumption Monte Carlo. So this, I mean, this is a, this is a pretty important finding, right? So um, just by kind of improving your forecasting model um, in doing retirement income planning, you can reduce the error of these risk estimates um, by you know, a, a, a sizable amount. So this would be you know, kind of like choosing between rain forecasting models and, and just saying, hey, let's, let's do the one, it's not perfect, right? But let's do the one that it's, that generally has lower error and is and is predicting rain a little bit better, rain or dry a little bit better. Okay, so um, this is uh, showing us the the calibration of these models. Now I know this is a this is a complicated chart, and actually I, I realize it doesn't it doesn't match the the rain forecasting one we had before, but. What you have here is if if we're above the black line, so the black line is is um, perfect calibration, right? So every time I predict eighty percent chance of success, I eighty percent of those cases succeed. Um, again, we don't expect that that to happen. Um, and then if you're above the line, you're actually getting more success than you predicted. So this isn't so much what, what we're looking at here isn't predicting rain; it's predicting dry, right? Um, so if you're above the line, um, we would have what, what you would call a, a wet bias. So um, you're predicting a lower probability of success than you're actually getting. And it, just like in rain forecasting, um, most people prefer a wet bias. There's even evidence that that rain forecasts actually have a wet bias, whether that's because of the model or, or because you know the, the meteorologist um, is, is doing that on purpose. I, I don't know. But it could even be the latter because people would prefer to bring an umbrella and not use it than to not bring an umbrella and wish they had. Um, so the wet bias probably is um, is something that forecasters prefer, and that that's likely true for um, retirement planners as well, right? So again, uh, under promising, over delivering is what we see above the line. Um, so there's some really not notable things here. I'll, if we just look at, let's say, you know, kind of above about 55% probability of success, um, which are the, that's kind of the range that most uh, plans are going to be in. In fact, most ad advisors say they actually prefer kind of 
I think in the 70 to 90 range is what um, Derek, I think, found in a survey, um, though he can correct me. Um, what we see here is that in particular, uh, traditional Monte Carlo, um, which is kind of the most widely used model, um, has a consistent dry bias. So it's actually um, predicting higher probability of success than we actually saw historically. So it's underestimating risk. Um, another way to look at it is using this model would um, lead to um, advice for, for higher income levels than, than uh, a client probably should be taking at that at that risk level, you know, if they have a certain risk appetite. Um, Regime-based Monte Carlo has a consistent wet bias, so it's generally overestimating risk. Um, the difference is maybe, uh, you know, slightly less, so it has a lower wet bias than, than traditional has a dry bias, but, but they both have these, these pretty consistent biases in, in this range. Um, historical um, tends to be fairly tight around the the you know the perfect calibration line but it, it likes to bounce back and forth and and it has a little bit more of a dry bias um, in this range um, than it does a wet bias um, so again maybe a, a not the kind of under promise over deliver type of uh, type of model what about um looking at how predictions came out um in different periods in time because what we're looking at here is across the entire period 1951 to 2002 um and the reason it stopped at 2002 by the way is um we were looking at, at predictions for at least for 20 years um and, and so that's the last time we could have made a 20-year prediction and found out how it turned out um so here we look we're looking at traditional monte carlo and the reduced um capital market assumption version and um, what we see is, uh, you know, neither one does does particularly well across this entire period. Um, you do see that reduced Monte Carlo does particularly well in certain periods, and those are the times that turned out um, were not great times to retire. Um, basically, those were times that you needed to be a little bit more conservative, and so reduced Monte Carlo, um, of course, it's designed to be more conservative. So it's kind of a one hit wonder, right? It does well in periods where it turns that that it turns out are not um, uh, great periods to retire and are those periods that that we would prefer people be more conservative. Um, traditional Monte Carlo is is um, it does have a couple of times when it's sort of okay, but but mostly it's it's among the worst um, possible ways to do it. Um, so in the in the the sixties um, were kind of a period where, um, because of high inflation and low real returns, that that wasn't a time that that really supported really high systematic withdrawals. That's where we get the four percent rule from, and so on. Um, Regime-based Monte Carlo and historical, on the other hand, they're not always the absolute best. Um, although regime-based gets pretty darn close to being always the best, um, but uh, they they do seem to perform better across different kinds of environments, right? So they do well when that in periods that turn out to be poor. They do better comparatively in turn in periods that turn out to to be great times to retire. For example, the the mid mid 80s um, you know, turned out to be historically one of the times that people could have taken the highest um, systematic withdrawals because inflation was coming down, interest rates were coming down, stocks were doing well, and, and so on. So none of the the plans did, you know, their best at this period. Uh, none of the models did their best at this period, but uh, regime-based and, and historical were, were doing the best. Um, you'll also notice in kind of the, the tech bubble um, and, uh, you know, in other periods, uh, regime-based was, had the lowest errors in these time periods. Okay. Um, so, that's a lot of data, a lot of graphs and things. What, what, is this, what does this mean for us? Um, First of all, um, I, like a caveat, there, there are other ways to, to model the world. Um, in fact, there are even ways within Income Lab that, that are not in this, this study. Um, so I think the first thing this shows us is not all models are the same. Um, and there really are differences that would really matter to clients and to the advice that we give clients. And so it's worth paying attention to 
the kind of model you're using to model risk and to and to give you estimates and forecasts about the future. Um, for for the four that we looked at, uh, it's it's really important to note that traditional Monte Carlo consistently underestimated risk at the levels that are most important to planners. So you know I'll ask Derek to to comment on that in a bit, um, and that regime-based Monte Carlo and historical analysis had less error. So at least among these four, these, these are clearly to be preferred when, when doing retirement planning. Um, it's worth thinking also about this wet and dry bias. So what kind of bias? We're, we're going to have imperfections. We're going to have errors. So what kinds of errors would we prefer in, in the, the tools that we use to, to um, back up our, our advice? Um, I think it's at least reasonable that some would prefer a, a, a wet bias. And, and among the, the models we looked at, regime-based Monte Carlo um, had the most consistent wet bias. That gives you the ability to kind of uh, bias you toward giving good advice through, or, or sorry, positive news through retirement, right? Hey, things are better than we expected. Maybe most importantly, though, here, no model was even close to error-free. Right. I mean, the the you saw it in the calibration charts, but but even just the error numbers, right? The, the lowest we saw was was 0.12, right? Um, it, these are not error free things. These are not, not things where you can look at your predictions and say, oh, I know exactly what someone should do and I will be right. Um, they give you um, certainly directional information. They, they help you give good advice, but one interpretation is of this is we can't really do one-time planning. The, the errors will be so large, we can't have enough confidence to do that. And so plans should really have a game plan for adjustment and be monitored regularly because as time goes on, we'll learn more and more about the world that a, a client is actually living through, right? So bring it back to the, the rain analogy, you know, we can make a prediction about rain a week from now. Um, and as we get closer, if we, if we never looked at data again, when we never updated our models, we never said, oh, this is the world we're living in, um, then we would have probably fairly bad forecasts, you know, the day of, right? But if I'm looking at the, the radar, right, I see the storms approaching, or I see, you know, there are no storms, it's completely uh, clear sky, right? I can give people better and better advice as, as time goes on, right? I mean, looking at the sky is, is, is better than looking at a, a long range forecast. Um, so I think we need to be humble about the, the kinds of information we actually have um, for, for clients and, and the kind of the, the quality of the, of the forecast that we have. We certainly should use the best uh, available forecasts, um, but we also need a, a, a game plan for change and a game plan for um, adjusting our, uh, our forecasts over time. Um, so with that, I will um, bring on Derek here. And Derek, I don't know if you want to comment about kind of the import of this for for planning, and uh, maybe keep me honest on what the uh, what the range that uh, advisors prefer is. Yeah. So the the range we saw was really, and we were asking about the minimum acceptable, and that range we ended up finding was seventy to ninety five percent. So that was kind of the where advisors would put their minimum. Um, and so yeah, I, I do think when you really focus in on that range and we look at the results there and we see which models are how they're performing and how we might you know if a model is going to err in one direction which direction might we want that to be um, I think there's a perception out there that a lot of people feel like well I'm going to use traditional Monte Carlo um, because I want to model you know realities that might be worse than uh, what we've seen historically. And so I thought that was really interesting to see. Actually, no, that, you know, the, so when we're back testing this, that's not actually what we're seeing in the, the results is that's actually kind of flipped that uh, traditional Monte Carlo is uh, you know, getting, is biased in the wrong direction um, if if that's what you're trying to aim, aim for. And I do think having, you know, that wet bias, so to speak, overestimating the risk um, within that range, you know, it could there could be something that, that that makes sense. Some people though, I could see saying, you know, I want to maybe I'll account for that wet bias in some other ways. Maybe I just want the truest number I can possibly get. And at least from this historical might be the direction I would lean. Um, but then from there, you know, maybe somebody still is 
through various ways. Maybe they don't account for home equity. Maybe they don't account for other types of things that they see as being uh, providing some of that protection um, that we might still get or want in a forecast. But yeah, overall, I just thought it was really fascinating work and to be able to, for Justin to be able to use the, basically the income lab you know, the engine and the power behind it to be able to go and do this and provide that insight. Uh, you know, re really cool to actually see how that would have um, performed historically and provide some, what I think is new insight into uh, how we, how we think about the different models that we use. Derek, in your own um, planning, have you tended, you know, since you started using Income Lab, um, was there an analysis method that you've favored? Have you have you used more than one in certain cases? I would say there are times when I'll, you know, if I'm really feeling like, oh, do I need to check multiple things here? Do I need to look at this from different perspectives? Um, I have, I've used the term kind of triangulate before in terms of look at different results and see, okay, you know, from those where where might I get my target? But honestly, one one thing I really like about the historical is getting the more consistent results instead of, you know, like with Monte Carlo um, and even regime-based Monte Carlo, getting a new role of, uh, you know, guardrails essentially as the plan gets updated. So I've probably leaned more towards historical, almost more from a practicality. And, and this, this result made me feel good about that. But at the same time, if I you know, if I was really concerned, I'd say for a lot of my clients, I'm running plans where I feel like there's multiple layers of um, kind of protection built in, in the sense that I'm not accounting for home equity. Usually I'm usually putting things on very conservative settings and assuming the longest longevity. Uh, but if I was pushing it more of an edge case type plan, then I do think, um, you know, maybe the, the fact that the regime based Monte Carlo is going to change from one plan of the or, um, one run of the plan to the next, that still might be worthwhile to get a little bit more of that extra um, conservativeness just built into it. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's an interesting point. So especially like you said, if you have clients who um, you know can can maybe their their resources and their spending are are, are such that they, they can kind of afford to at least start out retirement in the in the kind of lowest risk, highest success range here, um, then like you said, I mean, the, the, the blue line is, uh, it, it obviously does have some error, but it's, it's, it's very close. And then if you have kind of back pocket, Hey, you know, we could always tap this other thing and, and so on. Um, not to mention that you're actually, you're starting fairly low risk. And so you've already, um, you've already tilted the scales so that the likelihood that they actually have to reduce from that point is quite low. And the likelihood you might have good news for them anyway is, is, is quite high. Um, so yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, one thing I noticed on regime based is, you know, there are particular periods. I, I, I actually found this pretty interesting. I mean, it, granted the, the green line is, is often the lowest period, but um, the, the times where it really dives down for, so for example, in, um, the, uh, the dot com era here, it, it tends to do a pretty interestingly good job when things are kind of extreme. Um, so, you know, in this case, famously is like the highest Cape ever was right. So the, so the Cape filter here is, is, is really allowing regime base to say, Hey, we're, you know, do not assume you're going to get, you know, 1980s style returns from now on. Um, and clearly it, you know, it, it turned out to be, to be right in this case. So it's an interesting way to kind of have different capital market assumptions in different periods, you know, without it just being, you know, pure opinion or something like that. Um, it's interesting that historical does pretty well, even without that filter, actually on income web, you, you can apply a, a similar filter, but even without the filter, um, historical does quite well. Um, I don't know if you have thoughts on why that might be. I I mean, the my only thought on in terms of why historical sometimes does perform well in a lot of situations like these does come back to, it's just a more, compared to Monte Carlo, it's a more realistic um, kind of market behavior in terms of we see mean reversion, we see momentum, we see some of those effects that you don't actually 
you know, that, I mean, you, you could program them into Monte Carlo simulation, like that could be done, but generally speaking, um, it's just a random draw from one time period to the next time period. And there's no uh, correlation within time periods that we're taking a look at. And so I think that to me is one reason why maybe we see you know, historical uh, performs well as it captures some of that real world type uh, type movement. Yeah. Yeah, I agree that 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 could be true. Like you, you, you know, we put in capital market assumptions. You've got even with regime based, you just have two sets, right? Near term and long term. And for each of those, you have an average, a standard deviation, and you got a correlation matrix. Well, in reality, what the joke is, right? The only thing that goes up in uh, bear markets is correlations, right? So you're not able to say, hey, correlations will change too over time, and and, and so on. And so historical does just kind of capture whatever what, whatever the um, the the relationships between assets uh, can be in the real world. Okay, um, I think looks like we've got quite a few uh, questions here, Taylor. Yeah. Um, so some of them oh, can be answered together, I guess. Uh, okay. The first one is: um, Have this has this research been published somewhere? Uh, Derek and I have a draft that's that's being edited right now. Um, so I. Yeah, hopefully we'll see it somewhat soon. But no, this would be a, a webinar exclusive here. You're getting a first look. <laughs> Good answer, Derek. Um, <laughs> next one is, um, how do you think this research applies to building plans and income labs specifically? Using historical versus regime, et cetera, does it make you want to build plans using any model specifically? I might take this one just from a, I guess the practitioner perspective. I, the way I look at it, um, I, I had always kind of lean regime based and historical before um, between those two. And as I mentioned, historical, I, I also like for some other reasons, just in terms of getting consistency between uh, iterations of a plan I might be running. But um, I think that to me only kind of solidifies that, that uh, now I, lean even harder on um, using either regime-based or historical as my preferred uh, method. And again, there's different contexts or situations I might use one or the other, but uh, those would be the two I would tend to go to. Yeah. And I would, I guess I have some, some thoughts on that as well. I, I think I always um, had a bias toward historical because of, you know, what we were just talking about with how you're kind of capturing changes in correlation and, and really modeling a really wide range of, of possible worlds and worlds that we know can exist because they have existed. Um, this increased my confidence in regime-based Monte Carlo. Um, I, I personally like the wet bias. I think that it's nice to be able to um, kind of uh, give people um, good news. Um, and, and I don't think that the wet bias is so extreme that you're, um, you know, kind of giving way out wrong answers or anything like that. I've also seen in practice um, that there are certain plans that could really benefit from regime-based over historical. The, the main example I can think of there is um, plans that are really subject to inflation risk. So if you're using regime-based and you're able to say, no, look, in the first 10 years or five years or whatever your near-term period is, let's assume inflation is really high. Then you're able to kind of say, hey, Let's let's do a plan that for this particular risk, I, I have kind of been conservative. If you're using historical and you're not filtering it at all, which which again in income lab you actually can filter, but um, then you're getting periods of time with low inflation, periods of time with high inflation, periods of time with deflation. Uh, so you're getting a, a really cool broad range of things, but you're including in the simulation some periods that um, you probably don't think are likely to happen. Now we, we could be wrong, right? But um, you know that that's one place I've really seen regime based be regime based uh, be be useful for for getting um, getting at the issue that somebody has. So a good example of that is if if you have a lot of pension income that's not adjusted for inflation, um, that could be a plan that's really subject to inflation risk. And so you know you might want a, a particular tool to to help give those clients really good um, targeted advice. And just to tack quickly onto that too, as well, I think, uh, you know, the economic environment we're in can be another reason where like a lot of people were concerned, you know, 
go back a year, maybe not not so much now, but a year ago, with high market valuations, low interest rates, uh, you know, the wanting to capture some of that in their capital market assumptions. So when there's particular economic concerns, uh, just similar to Justin's point there with certain plan types, I think that could be another reason where regime-based Monte Carlo is is a much better approach than this across the board, reduce everything Monte Carlo, which clearly just gets you know too far off of reality, in my opinion. Yeah, I guess we didn't address that one too much. I mean, definitely it 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 moved the the dry bias. It got got rid of most of the dry bias, but um, really, it, it like I said, it's kind of a one hit wonder. So it it only works when when things are going to be bad, right? Because you're it, so it doesn't work. Kind of, it's not an all weather type model. Um, so, um, just a reminder that we do have some questions in here. If you'd like to hear the answer, you can vote for them. Uh, we do. You know, we have are limited on time, so I wanted to make sure that the most important or most uh, voted on questions are getting answered. Uh, there is one that says, when um, when referring to, I guess we can go back to to Derek's question. It says, Derek, do you discuss the pros and cons of different models with clients, or do you triangulate behind the scenes? Almost always behind the scenes. If a particular client wants to dive into it, I want to be prepared and you know, ready to explain that. But yeah, it is very rarely that um, I'm getting into any of the type of stuff we're talking about here today uh, with a client. I'm usually focused much more on the guardrails um, and those levels so that they just understand here's when an adjustment would be called for. Uh, the next one is, have you extended the rolling five-year analysis to and beyond 2007 to 2009? And I think that's kind of partnered with speculate how 30-year analysis might have scored out. Yeah, we actually, it, it, because we were doing 20-year forecasts uh, in order to, to get at least to the tech bubble, um, we also did the exact same study with 30-year forecasts and for the period that overlaps, right? So this that only let us get through uh, 1992. Um, the results for 20-year and 30-year forecasts were very, very close. So that like the, the correlation between those results was was very close, which, you know, we, we won't know uh, how 30-year forecasts in 2002 really work out until 10 years from now, but it does give me confidence that hey, given that they were very similar for the periods that do overlap. Um, I, I feel relatively comfortable saying, hey, these models might perform similarly for 30-year forecasts. We didn't do it for 10-year or five-year forecasts. That that would obviously be a great way to extend this research, um, extending it to other models, right? I mentioned being able to filter history or you, know, you might have other ways of creating capital market assumptions. Um, other types of plans is, is an obvious one, right? Plans with... Social security plans with the retirement hatchet that Derek and I have talked about before, plans with um, the retirement smile, all of those kinds of things are you know relevant for for planners because you're you're dealing with real situations that that really do have those characteristics. So I think that's a direction we will go at some point. But in presenting research, you know, it's usually a good idea just to use a very simple, um, simple uh, approach. So when it comes to the Monte Carlo models, and the question is, are what are other you know tech companies using? Whether it's eMoney, Riskalyze, others, and are these results actually Income Lab results? So I'll take the last part. Um, these are, in a sense, actual Income Lab results because these are uh, models that are available. Um, inside of Income Lab. So you can do historical analysis, you can do regime-based Monte Carlo, you can do traditional Monte Carlo, and you could go in and customize your traditional Monte Carlo and take take 2% off. Um, so in that sense, they are they are results that, you know, it's basically saying if you had used Income Lab to, you know, make forecasts at each monthly point in time between 1951 and, and 2002, um, you know, these would have been the outcomes. There is something missing from this entire discussion, which is, um, you know, Income Lab doesn't depend on success and failure. It depends on adjustment. So so people wouldn't have just, you know, set a plan going and done nothing. Um, they would have adjusted along the way. So um, in that sense, you know, plans wouldn't have succeeded or failed. They would have adjusted. So 
Uh, I think this is this is maybe a little too abstract to say that they're income lab uh, results. We actually do have some other um, things coming out next month uh, in beta that that deal with that question of like what would actual income lab results with adjustments and so on have looked like. So uh, you'll have to come to our next webinar for that one. Um, Derek, I don't know. On, on the other tech um, side of things, I mean, we certainly tried to use um, it to, to test models that are actually, you know, close stand-ins for things that are being used in the industry, right? We wanted this to be practical, um, but I, I don't know that we have, you know, um, a, a list of who uses what in the yeah, I mean, we didn't necessarily map it to like, here's every provider's what they do in terms of how they do Monte Carlo. But I think just in general, um, you know, the most platforms, it's just a traditional Monte Carlo, uh, probably where the variation is, is what capital market assumptions do they default to? And how is that set? That can even vary by firm or company level. If your firm or company has a particular set of capital market assumptions they want to use. So a lot of variation um, there, but we, you know, again, tried to try to get the traditional Monte Carlo here to just be as kind of neutral, common uh, type of a application of traditional Monte Carlo. So partnering yeah. with that, when referring to utilizing historical Monte Carlo, the inputs for traditional software, Money Guide Pro, Right Capital, would be to default the historical asset class returns within the program rather than projected returns? Yeah, I think our 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 two kinds of traditional Monte Carlo that you know tradi what we call traditional and reduced capital market assumptions were meant to be stand-ins for those two approaches. So typically um, you will get default assumptions that are based on history up to that point. 30-year averages are, are pretty common. Um, but there's nothing magic about those. There might be a, a firm that does, you know, 40 or 50 year averages. Um, and then the reducing it by 2% was meant to be a stand in for um, forecasts. Um, so we don't expect that typically forecasts uh, are to be, you know, 2% higher than history. Um, at least in recent history, what I've, what I've generally seen is that they're more muted. Um, and, and so that was kind of our stand in for, for, you know, using kind of your favorite capital market forecasts. And one one just kind of side note on that that I think is is relevant though. And Justin, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the like when you look at some of the forward looking assumptions, one that's pretty popular is like the JP Morgan um uh, capital market assumptions. But those are 10 year assumptions, correct? Justin, those are not I think to... they are I, um you know I haven't looked at them recently. And that is yeah one of the one of the reasons I think people have have liked, at least researchers have liked the idea of regime-based Monte Carlo, although I, as far as I know, Income Lab is the only place that's actually available, um, is is exactly that. It, it's not hard to find forecasts, but they don't tend to be 30-year forecasts or, you know, 40-year forecasts or however long your, your plan might be, 20-year forecasts. They tend to be kind of medium-term forecasts. Um, and so, you know, maybe you have a forecast for lower, um, I don't know, bond returns. Um, and you might even be right, but it's not clear you want that to be your forecast for 30 years. You might just want it to be your forecast for five, eight, 10 years, and, and then revert to something else afterwards. So um, that's uh, one reason I think researchers have liked um, regime-based Monte Carlo. And and um, I think the evidence from that we presented here is that actually also in practice, it might be a, a, a viable option and definitely one that seems better than um, just straightforward traditional Monte Carlo. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I just mentioned that because I know that's one that commonly sometimes advisors, I think, may not realize, oh, wait, this is a 10-year forecast. It's not a 30-year. So whatever capital market assumptions you're using, um, you do want to be careful to make sure you understand what they're what the time frame is intended for those as well. I saw a question about where you do this in um, Income Lab. So I just thought I'd show everybody. Um, if you want to change in a particular plan, what kind of analysis you're doing, go to the plans advanced settings, go to plan analysis, and you can change it right here. Um, you can also change the default that you want for your 
um, for all new households that you create by going to settings, default values. Um, the default in this, you know, just fake account here is historical, but you know, if you want to always use regime-based, you can just save that. That won't change any existing plans or households. So um, this would only be for, for new ones. But you can change it plan by plan. You can change it plan by plan by going to the plans advanced settings. Yeah. And if you copy a plan, it's it's copying that setting from the plan you're copying. So it it's um you're not getting that new default setting. And there's no way to combine them. There's no combination. There's not. Uh, no. So make sure. Okay. Uh we have time probably for one or two more questions. This is in follow-up to that. When using regime-based analysis in Income Lab, does the user have to provide the 10-year projections or can Income Lab provide or suggest them based on similar periods in history? Yeah, so that's what we do. Um, actually, there's an article about this in our knowledge base, but um, the defaults in Income Lab are, are, are created formulaically. So it's not like, um, you know, Derek and Justin sit around and think, ah, what do we think? You know, will happen over the next 10 years. It's pure formula. So we take all of history. So it's it's basically this. Um, uh, we take all of history and then we filter it um, for economic context. Now we don't just use CAPE. We, we use kind of a, a conglomerate of economic factors. And we say, hey, you know, the early 80s were not like, today because CAPE was really low and you know interest rates were 14% and, and things like that. And then using those periods of history, we um, we create the near-term and the long-term um, assumptions, near-term being returns that were close, you know, in time to those times that were uh, like today, and um, long-term being the next periods. So, and we update those every month. Um, and again, it's totally formulaic. Um, you can do custom um, and, and create your own. It's just a toggle. Um, and then if you go back to default, you'll you'll reload the um, the the defaults that were created um, from historical uh, averages. All right. Well, I I think we have time for maybe one more. It said, what would have to change in the real world for regime based to be questionable going forward? I know you mentioned inflation. Justin, but anything further on that? Um, let me think about ways that regime based would be was was the question for to be questionable going forward. So I think what you would have to have for for anything where there's like a, a filter being used, which is how we do what how we create regime based uh, assumptions. Um, look, if your regime based assumptions are turn out to be good, there's really nothing to make regime based bad, right? I mean, the assumption is that your your capital market assumptions were good. So the way that regime based wouldn't work is if the capital market assumptions turn turn out to be just just bad, just wrong. So for example, if we're filtering with CAPE, we're filtering out low CAPE periods. Well, low CAPE periods were generally followed by good stock returns. Um, so we're filtering out the periods that had good stock returns, which means your near term assumptions are generally going to be lower stock returns. If it turns out that really high stock returns are are you know coming, even though CAPE is already really high, um, that those would be bad assumptions, right? We would get we would get bad performance. So basically, things would have to kind of flip on their heads from how they've been in in history um, for for regime based to to perform poorly. And mm -hmm. you know, could that happen? Uh, possibly, um, but it uh, you know history is the only data that we actually have, so um, it's. Uh, it's uh, I would probably be uh, reluctant to it to assume that will definitely happen. Yeah, I would just add to that. You would only know that after the fact, and I still would probably lean towards using some of that insight, the economic context to plan based on what we know in the moment. Um, and then the other uh, other way of thinking about that question, I guess it's a little bit different, but if we're in just a like perfectly average time, where the economic context isn't actually doing anything, you you might be in a situation where you're getting basically the same result. It's just not doing as much, but um, it wouldn't hurt. Yeah, yeah. And to that that point, also, I think this is where um, 
having a game plan for, for adjustments like this is, okay, this is what we're going to do. And we'll do this until we have clear reason to change. Um, and then having a plan for what those changes would be, when they'll happen, how big they are, and so on. Um, that kind of makes getting this number exactly right, um, you know, a little less important. And that's that's good because these numbers are not exactly right. Uh, they, they just can't be that. Again, that was sort of the um, probably the, the second biggest takeaway from from this work is just that um, there's there's always error. And so um, if the future turns out worse than the past, um, we'll learn that as we go on in time and we'll adjust to it to accommodate that. We can't hope to predict it ahead of time. All right, well, we are at the top of the hour. So I figured we would wrap this up. Um, this has been recorded and it will be available and distributed uh, via email to the attendees and the folks that registered. Uh, there was just a follow-up if this when you publish this research, do you know where it would be published? Uh, just uh, thought that that you might be able to answer that, Derek or Justin. People people might know where we've published research in the past commonly. I, I don't know. I, I don't want to say too much before it's gone through any processes or gotcha. you know, been evaluated, but um, common places where you see me write stuff might be a good place to go check out. Yes, yeah, and we'll, we'll, we'll announce it from the mountaintop when it's uh, when it's out. So, well, thank you all for attending. Again, we do have a lab talk Tuesday, the third Tuesday of every month, and then an educational webinar the fourth Tuesday of every month. Uh, thank you all for being engaged with your questions, and if you need anything further, uh, contact us at info at incomelaboratory dot com. Justin, Thanks, and Derek, anything further? Thanks, everyone. All right, thank yeah. you.